السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أي على الصلاة ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وجاهد في سبيل الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته الصالحين الغر الميامين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا ثم أما بعد Brothers and sisters The books of Sirah tell us that when the Muslims were still in Mecca at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa at the height of persecution that the companions were facing from Quraysh when some of the companions had started to migrate to Habasha, to Abyssinia one day things became so difficult that even Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu 
a man who came from a strong family, a man who was an affluent, rich man, but he had given up a lot of his wealth for the sake of Islam by that time. But even a man like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq started to feel the heat of persecution to such an extent that he decided to pack up and leave for Habasha. And so he packed up his stuff and he left Mecca to go towards Habasha, to Abyssinia. But on the way, when he had just left town, he was met by a man named Ibn Ad-Daghina. Ibn Ad-Daghina. So when Ibn Ad-Daghina saw Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he asked him, where are you going? So Abu Bakr said, I am leaving Mecca and I am migrating to Abyssinia. And he told him the, the persecutions that the Muslims were facing and he himself was facing. And Ibn Daghina is not a Muslim. He is a disbeliever and a resident of Mecca. He knows Abu Bakr. He's an idol worshipper. But when he hears the story of Sayyidina Abu Bakr and he sees that he's leaving town, he says to him these words. He says, إِنَّ مِثْلَكَ لَا يَخْرُجْ وَلَا يُخْرَجْ فَإِنَّكَ تَكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومِ وَتَصِلُ الرَّحِمِ وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلِّ وَتَقْرِ الضَّيْفِ وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ وَأَنَا لَكَ جَارِ فَارْجِعْ فَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ بِبِلَادِكَ The hadith is found in Sahih al-Bukhari. He said to him that the likes of you cannot leave and cannot be kicked out. You help the poor and the needy. You are good to your relatives. You care for the weak and the downtrodden. You're generous to your guests. And you help those who are fighting for justice. Go back to your town and worship. And I will protect you. And then he walked back with him to Mecca and he went in front of the Kaaba and Ibn Daghina made an announcement that I am granting protection to Abu Bakr. And so Abu Jahl said, then we accept. If you grant him protection, then we will not harm him. These words that Ibn Daghina said to Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq are very similar, very in fact identical to the words that were said by Sayyida Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to her in a state of fear and worry, shivering because he had just had his first encounter with Sayyiduna Jibreel when he received the first revelation, Iqra he came to Sayyida Khadija in that state and as his wife tried to comfort him Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shared with her the worry that he had that what are people going to say about him, people are going to reject him. And at that moment Sayyidah Khadija said to him, Kalla, Wallahi ma yukhzika Allahu abada. She said to him, don't worry, Allah will never disgrace you. And then she said, why? Because she said, innaka la tasilu rahim, wa tahmilu al-kal. وتكسب المعدوم وتقري الضيف وتعين على نوائب الحق because you're good to your family members because you care for the weak because you help the poor and the needy because you're generous with your guests and because you help those who are fighting for justice what we learn from this brothers and sisters is that the Muslims the early Muslims, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had developed a reputation in Mecca before Islam even came. They had developed a reputation of that they were people who were involved in society, that were an asset to society. That Ibn Daghina said, Inna mithlaka la yakhruj wa la yukhraj. Someone like you cannot leave town 
And nobody can expel you from this town. I will help you. Come with me. They had gained such a reputation that they were recognized for the asset that they were, for the society and benefit that they brought to the community in which they lived. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before he started preaching his message, 20 years before he even received the first revelation, when he was a young man of 20 years of age, he participated in a treaty that is known as Hilful Fudul. Hilful Fudul. This gathering that took place in Mecca, where certain tribes of Quraysh gathered together and they made an agreement. And the agreement was that from now on, they would side with the oppressed against the oppressor regardless of which tribe the oppressor belonged to. Even if the oppressed was from a faraway tribe and the oppressor was from Quraysh, they made an agreement that they would stand up for the oppressed against the oppressor. This was something new in Mecca. Things didn't used to happen like that before that. But because of certain events that took place at that time, they were forced to come together and come to this agreement. And this was a beautiful pact. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam attended that gathering and participated in that agreement. And years later, decades later, after he had become a prophet, he was sitting with his companions and he was remembering that day. And he made a remark to them and he said, and the hadith is in Bukhari, he said, I witnessed in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an, a treaty, a pact, that were I asked to uphold it in Islam today, I would do so. And I would not give my place for that meeting in exchange for a large flock of red camels. What does this show, brothers and sisters? Again, this shows that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a man who cared for his community, who was involved in what was going on, who participated in things that were noble and just causes. He was not some unknown person that nobody knew of that suddenly came and started preaching his message. He had built a reputation for that. And you all know that he was even called a sadiq al-Amin. As-Sadiq al-Amin, the truthful, the trustworthy, before he became a prophet. And you all know the famous incident where they reconstructed the Kaaba. This happened before he became a prophet. When the Quraysh was rebuilding the Kaaba and they, a dispute broke out between them because they were fighting for who would put the black stone in its place. Every tribe wanted to have that honor to place the black stone in its place. And finally they decided that the way that they were going to resolve the dispute was to ask someone to arbitrate for them. And the person that they would choose as the arbitrator would be the first person who enters Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And when they started to look towards the entrance waiting for who would be that person who enters Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And here comes Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was not Rasulullah at that time. He was just Muhammad ibn Abdullah at that time. When he walks in, everybody smiles. Everybody is happy. And they say, Al-Ameen is here. Yes, we will do what he tells us to do. Al-Ameen is here. The one who we all trust. That was the reputation that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had gained among his people because of his character, because of his involvement, because of his being there for his people at all times. And then when he became a Rasul, when he became a messenger, did that change? Because now there was truth and falsehood. There was right and wrong. There was tawheed and shirk. Now, these people 
were committing shirk. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was preaching a message against shirk. Did he change? Did he not consider them to be his people anymore? Did he not care for them anymore? Did he fight against every single one of them and considered every single one of them to be his enemy? In fact, brothers and sisters, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would call these people qawmi, 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 my people. Ya Rabb, inna haulai qawmi. He would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, these are my people. Allahumma ghfir li qawmi. Allahumma ghfir li qawmi. Fa innahum la ya'lamoon. Ya Allah, please guide my people. Forgive my people because they don't know what they're doing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distinguishes brothers and sisters between different kinds of disbelievers. They're not all the same. There are those who uphold justice, who uphold and support causes of justice and morality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us in the Qur'an that our relationship with those non-Muslims has to be a, 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 a relationship, an interaction that is built on kindness, that is built on justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين That God does not forbid you from showing kindness and justice to those who do not fight you because of your religion, who do not drive you out of your homes. Allah does not forbid you from showing kindness and justice to those people. Indeed, Allah loves those who are just. Brothers and sisters, our attitude towards people who don't show enmity to Allah and His Messenger is this attitude that we deal with them with gentleness, with kindness, with fairness as our fellow citizens and as our brothers and sisters in humanity in humanity not in faith but in humanity yes we have our faith and we believe that it is the truth and we believe that other faiths are upon falsehood but that doesn't take away from the reality that we all come from a single pair of a male and a female as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, Ya أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed we have created you from a single male and female. All humanity come from that same source, that single source of one male and one female. And we have made you into nations and tribes. We have made you in these diverse different groups and nationalities and ethnicities and nations and tribes. Why? So that you hate one another? So that you fight one another? No. So that you know one another. And here Allah is not just talking to the believers. He doesn't start by saying, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. He's speaking to all human beings. Ya ayyuhal nas. Ya ayyuhal nas. All people. We have made you into nations and tribes so that you know one another. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even when he was persecuted to the point when he was forced to leave his homeland, his beloved homeland, Mecca, about which he said, As he left Mecca and he's turned around and he saw it one last time, he said, You are the most beloved of all places to me. And were it not for the fact that your people had kicked me out, I would never leave you. 
when they drove him out of Mecca, even at that point, brothers and sisters, he upheld fairness and justice. In his home, before he left, were sacks of wealth, gold and silver, that belonged to the disbelievers. That they had placed with him as a trust, as an amana. If he wanted to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he left on his migration journey, he could have taken a few of those sacks with him. And he could have justified that, that these belong to our enemies. But he did not do that. Because those sacks there were not placed by people who were coming to him to kill him. They were disbelievers, yes. But they were also noble people. And they had trusted him with that wealth. And he was not one to betray the trust, even against a non-Muslim, even against a mushrik, even against those who are driving him out of his land. He did not betray the trust. He did not break the law. He did not cheat them. He did not steal from them. But he left his son-in-law, Sayyiduna Ali ibn Abi Talib, Anhu, he left him there and made sure that he would return those, those, those things, those belongings to the ones to whom they belonged. And he left without taking anything, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, just like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the companions were known in their society, we should also be known among our people here. Our people here. Our people. We should be known among them. We should have, we should be known for our moral values. We should be known for our principles. We should be known for our contributions to the society. We should be known as law abiding citizens as people who are an asset to this country. When Abu Sufyan, we say, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, but before he accepted Islam, he was in, uh, in Byzantine, in Rome. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sent a letter to Heraclius, to the emperor, inviting him to Islam. This is after Sulh al Hudaybiyah. So Heraclius, when he read the letter from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he inquired whether there were any people in his land currently who knew Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Sufyan happened to be there. He was there for trade. So he called Abu Sufyan to his court. Abu Sufyan is leading the conflict against the Muslims at that time. He was the leader of Quraysh. Abu Jahl had died already. And he brings Abu Sufyan to his court and he has questions about the Prophet ﷺ. But he tells, he warns Abu Sufyan, you're not going to lie, you're going to tell me the truth. And Abu Sufyan found himself in a situation where he, even though he wanted to lie, he could not lie. Among the questions that Heraclius asked about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked him, do you know this man to be a liar? Have you seen lies from him in the past? So Abu Sufyan said, no. He was a sadiq, al amin And Abu Sufyan had to testify to that truth. No, he's well known to be a truthful person. He's well known for that. Next, Heraclius asks, is he a treacherous person? Does he betray his trust? Does he cheat? Does he deceive? Does he go back on his word? Does he break his promises? Does he backstab? And Abu Sufyan said, no, he's not. He wants to say yes, but he can't. He has to speak the truth. says, no, he's not. 
You see how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has developed a reputation even among his enemies of a person who upholds a certain moral character that people cannot deny. And brothers and sisters, even the early teachings of Islam, the earliest teachings of Islam, encouraged the Muslims to be people who give back to society, who are engaged civically, who bring benefit to those around them, who are involved in charitable projects and events, who are an asset to the society. What society? We're talking about in Mecca, when there was barely five or ten Muslims. How do I know that? Because just look at Surah Al-Duha. Surah Al-Duha, which according to many of the ulama, was the first surah as an entire surah, the first surah that was revealed to the Prophet And according to many of the ulama, this came only after Iqra. Iqra was the first revelation, the second was Wadduha. How many Muslims were there at that time? And what does Wadduha tell us to do? فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ And do not, turn, do not uh, speak harshly with the orphan. And do not turn away the beggar. I ask you, Billahi alaykum, which orphan is Allah talking about here? And which beggar is Allah talking about here? A Muslim beggar? A Muslim orphan? How many Muslim orphans and beggars were there at that time? Hardly any. Allah Azza wa is not making a distinction here between Muslim orphans and non-Muslim orphans. Muslim beggars and non-Muslim beggars. From day one, brothers and sisters, we have been encouraged and commanded and instructed by our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala to be there for people around us. Doesn't matter whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. To be there for them and to be recognized for that by people who don't share our faith with us but they recognize beauty when they see it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he used to give his khutab, his sermons, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that he does not remember a single khutbah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he did not give this piece of instruction to the Muslims. What was that piece of instruction? He would say, Ala la imana liman la amanata la wa la deena liman la ahda la la imana liman la amanata la wa la deena liman la ahda la that indeed the one who is not trustworthy has no faith. And the one who does not fulfill his promises has no religion. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this way would remind again and again the Muslims to be people who fulfill their trusts who are honest in their dealings. Just because I deal with a non-Muslim doesn't give me the license to cheat him. Just because I deal with a non-Muslim doesn't give me the license to break my promise or go back on my agreement or to backstab or to betray the trust. No, brothers and sisters. We have to be people who are known for these virtues even by the non-Muslims. And even when it comes to neighborly relations, neighborly relations, you know, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, one time he had a sheep that was slaughtered in his house, and the butcher is skinning the sheep. And Abdullah ibn Umar 
keeps telling him again and again to the point that his servant, Ibn Umar's servant, is like, how many times are you going to tell him that? You've already told him so many times. You know what he kept telling the butcher? He kept telling the butcher, please make sure you begin after you finish skinning, make sure you begin with our Jewish neighbor. In other words, the first share, please make sure, goes to our Jewish neighbor. Jewish neighbor. So when the servant says, how many times are you going to tell him that? You've already told him so many times. Ibn Umar said, you don't know. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to emphasize the right of the neighbor upon us so much that we were afraid that eventually Allah will reveal verses saying that the neighbor has to inherit from their neighbor. The point is that Abdullah ibn Umar recognizes that even if the neighbor is Jewish, that he has a right upon him, and he makes sure that he knows his neighbor, that he shares with his neighbor, that his neighbor knows him, and that his neighbor sees this hospitality and generosity from Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Brothers and sisters, this is the way of the Muslims. Muslims are not supposed to be people who just hide in their cocoons and nobody knows them. Muslims are supposed to be people who are supposed to bring benefit to wherever they are, to everywhere around them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us such people. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfiruh fa ya fawza al mustaghfirin. الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم أما بعد Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, لَيْسُوا سَوَاءَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ أُمَّةٌ قَائِمَةٌ يَتْلُونَ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ آنَاءَ اللَّيْلِ وَهُمْ يَسْجُدُونَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَأُولَئِكَ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <coughs> <clears throat> talking about the non-believers, please make space, brothers and sisters, for those who are coming in from the back. As you heard in the announcements, um, the gymnasium is not available today for the khutbah, so people need some more space. So try to make space for them as much as possible, especially in the back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, talking about the non-believers, that they're not all the same. Laysu sawa'a that from the people of the book, there are those who recite the ayat of Allah, who worship Allah, who believe in Allah, who believe in the afterlife, and who enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil. Who stand up for what is right and stand up against what is wrong. And there will always be non-believers like that, brothers and sisters. There will always be people among the non-Muslims who will stand up for what is right. And therefore what happened last week on Friday when we saw this, this outpour of this generous, this generous help from the police department that sent their officers here to guard our masjid and many other Muslim institutions in the city of Plano, voluntarily, not charging us a penny, from Fajr until Isha, and made their own strategy and plans and told us, don't worry, we'll take care of it all. These are people that stand up for what is right. And there are many other people, and we've seen people come out with signs of support, send letters, send flowers, send cards. There will always be people, لَيْسُوا سَوَاءَ There will always be people who will يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَلَى الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ And they compete to do acts that are good, that are noble. And even, you see in the example that I started with, with Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, Ibn al-Daghina, 
He is a non-Muslim. But he helps Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. He stands up for him. He protects him. He doesn't change his faith. Allah doesn't guide him to Islam. He dies as a non-Muslim. But he stands for what is right. But why did he support Abu Bakr? Because he knew him. Why does the police department come and help us? Because they know us. Because we maintain relationships with these departments. You saw the fire department was here last week collecting donations. But please, brothers and sisters, I remind myself and you that the reason why we maintain a relationship with them or the reason why you should maintain a relationship with your neighbors or your co-workers or other non-Muslims that you interact with at your own individual and family level, and we do that at an institutional level, the reason we do that is not because we expect something back from them. No. We do that because our deen commands us to do that. وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ زَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا As Allah says about the believers in Surah Al-Insan, that they are people who feed the needy and the hungry and support them and give charity. But they say, we don't seek anything in return from you. We don't want any reward from you. We're doing it just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't do it so that we will have protection when we need protection. Allah is our protector. But when they come out and show their support, we appreciate that. We thank them for that. And we know that there will always be people like that. But we have to do our part. We have to be good, law-abiding, virtuous, moral, charitable citizens of this country. We have to do that because our deen teaches us that. Because that is the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us be like that. Allahumma aghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, wal muslimina wal muslimat, al ahya'i minhum wal amwat. Innaka ya maulana sami'un qareebun mujibu al-da'wat. Bi rahmatika ya arham al-rahimin. عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون قوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمكم الله الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله